the word of God. I greet you with the words of Psalm 134, 1 and 2, which says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and cut that off, whoever's trying to get me. You know we're on Tuesday Night Live. But listen, as we share the word of God, we have a tremendous subject matter tonight entitled, Should All Homosexuals Be Put Out of the Church? And I tell you, my inbox has been going off. I've been receiving text messages of all the different uh, discussion that has been taking place. And so it is great that we're discussing, trying to see what God's word has to say in regard to this particular subject. As we get ready to go to the word of God, don't forget to follow, like, share, and subscribe. Follow, like, share, and subscribe, whatever page you are viewing this on, whether it is Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, wherever it might be, Twitter, I want you, Periscope, we want you to be sure to follow, like, share, and subscribe so that you can be in tune with all of what takes place as we share the Word of God week by week, every Tuesday night, live at 6 o'clock p.m. As long as the creek don't rise and the Lord delays His coming, we are here live and in living color. Start sharing this right now because I do have some very explosive things that I'm going to be sharing in regard to this subject, but I believe that it is going to be a blessing to the body of Christ. Don't forget real quickly that Life Center has Bible study every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. You can feel free to join us and be a part of a live Bible study. Don't forget also that uh, the Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ is coming up in the next few weeks, and the Department of Evangelism has a plethora of events that will be a benefit to your spiritual uh, well-being. Also, pay, uh, pay attention to my various uh, social media sites, and you can see where we'll be next. We're on our way next week to uh, Seattle, Washington, to the uh, wonderful church led by President Lawrence Bowles and his wonderful wife, and we'll be there redeemed by the blood, Pentecostal Church of God in Christ this coming week, as well as heading to Indiana, I believe, I don't have it before me, but I believe it's Lafayette, Indiana. We are heading there. We're also heading to Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, so many wonderful places that we'll be sharing the unsearchable riches of the gospel. Pray my strength in the Lord as we go forth and minister. Yes, sometimes I get tired. Yesterday, I was trying to start the car by pushing the button that you open the trunk with. And I'm pushing the button and can't figure out why is it that the car won't stop, but the trunk has come open. Uh, so <laughs> that lets you know every now and then this body does need rest. So again, I'm giving you a chance here to share with some others that were on the air and we're going to get ready to get started here in just a minute with the word, but start sharing like crazy. I want everybody to hear some of the things that we're about to say. Tell them don't wait until after I get off the line because a lot of people do that. They don't want me to see that they're watching, so they'll come and sneak on and watch after I'm um, off of the air live. But please tell them right now, join in because I want you to hear some things that I'm going to be sharing. And uh, it is very, very, very important pertaining to this subject, should all homosexuals be put out of the church. Now, don't forget my blog, my blog. Uh, I want you to go there every time I turn around blogspot.com. And on the blog, um, the latest article is dealing with this subject matter last week that was such um, an explosion uh, among the body of Christ in regard to forgiveness, forgiveness versus justice. And so you can find uh, that particular subject matter taking place on the blog. And somebody can put it down in the comment section. Every time I turn around dot blogspot.com. Come on, everybody, share some more so we can get those numbers up and get ready to present. Thank you. Last week, it was well over 10,000 people viewed uh, the teaching last week. Should all ministers be required to be married? That was the subject last week. And if you missed that, go to my YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and you will see the um, message there. Should all ministers be required to be married? Will that cut back on some of these scandals that we're seeing in the body of Christ if people uh, get married. Find out by studying along with that video. Listen, let's get ready to get started. Again, keep those numbers up. Thank you so much, Facebook. You're doing great. And uh, so is Instagram. Thank you so much. Let's get ready to pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. You afforded me to share the word. Now bless us as we go into what your word has to say to us. And we thank you for all the discussion that has already taken place in the comment section and the discussion that will take place. Help us to be a light in the midst of darkness. God, help us as believers to evangelize this world before the soon return of Jesus Christ. And we'll give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. 
Also, uh, you can go to the West Angeles channel and see the message that we presented and preached last week at West Angeles Church of God in Christ entitled, What You See is What You Get, a faith-building message that I, will be, that I do believe will be a blessing uh, to you. Let's get into this subject matter. What is the purpose of this lesson tonight? Should um, homosexuals be put out of the church? Obviously, we're not here to put anyone out of the church, but we are here to see what the truths of the Word of God would say to us tonight. As we go into this, there are some disclaimers that I need to make on behalf of the body of Christ, on behalf of the church. And as I refer to the church, I know that I'm a bishop uh, in the Lord's church and specifically in the church of God in Christ, but this lesson doesn't particular, uh, particularly, uh, uh, it's not specified to a particular denomination because I have people from all denominations and non-denominations that watch, and I have a lot of sinners that watch as well. I have a lot of enemies that watch, and they let me know that they're enemies. They give me a good cussing out every now and then. You don't know that you've been cussed out until you get a good cussing out, and I have had that happen so many times. But there are some acknowledgments that we have to make because many times there's a lot of hypocrisy that takes place in the body of Christ when we seek to handle subject matters like this. And some of those um, hypocritical things are this. We harp on certain sins and hardly mention others. We're going to learn today that there are well over 600 sins mentioned in the Bible. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, all unrighteousness is sin, whether it is this or anything else. All unrighteousness is sin, and we want to make sure that we have the right focus. Matthew 23, 23 says, Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. Now, realize this also. Some people are lashing out and acting out because of certain sins that have happened in the church that it appears that the church as a whole seems to ignore. For example, sexual abuse. And there are so many cases where young men, young ladies have been quote unquote turned out in the church and now they've entered into a uh, promiscuous lifestyle, homosexuality, lesbianism, adultery, fornication, prostitution, you name it. And uh, they wonder now, why is it that the church hasn't made mention of anything like this? And why doesn't the church deal with these particular sins, the sexual abuse of children? There are whole websites, there are whole uh, uh, social media sites that are totally set aside for individuals that have suffered at the hands of those that are in the church. Now, are we saying that all homosexuals are child abusers? Not so. From the stats that I have seen, sexual abusers come from every sexual orientation. And whoever does it, it is both a crime and it is a sin from whatever the source may be. Again, there's much hypocrisy that takes place in the body of Christ. Also, we do have respect to persons. Specifically, James chapter 2 Verse 8 through 9 talks about that. We give certain individuals a pass while we crucify other individuals. Certain people can get away with, quote, unquote, murder. And other people, if they sneeze, they're going to hell. We should not have that kind of respect to persons in the church. And that's why it is when messages are preached on particular subjects, people look and they say, wait a minute, you harp on one thing, but you leave the others undone. James chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 says this. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. It says, but if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. We have that even when it comes to preachers. There are certain preachers that are studied up, fasted up, prayed up, love God, love the people of God, but because they're not our favorite, um, what they say will go in one ear and out the other. And then you have somebody else, you know, just because they're a particular celebrity or well-known, you know, they can get up and say, Hubba Bubba Licious. Woo, Jesus, he said Hubba Bubba Licious. Don't even know what he's talking about, but just because of so-and-so and so. So we have that respect to persons. Also in the church, one of the things that we have to acknowledge as far as many mistakes, again, what I'm doing now as I start off is acknowledging how we don't always handle things correct in the church. Because again, when subject matters like this are preached about, people will point and say, well, you know, you go into Leviticus where it says a man is not to lie with a man and that's an abomination, but yet you're wearing mixed clothing or you eat too much or you talk too much. All unrighteousness is sin. I'm, I'm, I'm not sending everybody to hell, but when you look at Paul and Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two, Romans chapter three, 
Uh, he sends the Jews to hell. He sends the Gentiles to hell. Finally, in Romans 3.23, he said, all y'all going to hell. He said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he says in the sixth chapter and 23rd verse of Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so one of the main sins that we're going to have to stop doing in the church, in the body of Christ, is having respect to persons, giving a certain person a pass because, you know, that so-and-so, and then crucifying this one because they're not on our favorite list or they're not our best friend. Um, one of the things also we do in church, we preach against homosexuality, but a lot of times if a person is in that lifestyle and they're in the music industry, we shout to their music. And so that sends a, a conflicting message to our children and to this generation. Well, you talk against it, you preach against it, but then, you know, when the music is playing, you shout to it. So which way is which? So these are some things we have to consider. Another thing which really troubles me, and when I say troubled me, this, this is almost nauseating to hear because even though I'm a bishop, even though I'm a national officer in my denomination, the Church of God in Christ, I am a pastor at heart. And that's why there's so many people. I have two people. They don't have anything but maybe 60 followers. But I have two people come after me every week ready to send me to the cross. You should be doing this. And, and, and where are you getting the time to do that? And why are you... You know, people have multiple gifts. People serve as teachers. People serve as pastors. They serve as evangelists. They don't necessarily just have one gift. So I have an evangelistic gift. I have a, a um, pastoral gift, a teaching gift, and I'm utilizing all these gifts. When I die and go to heaven, I want to be completely empty. I want to say goodbye world. I'm gone. I've done everything God has told me to do. I've finished my course. I've totally emptied myself out. So teaching is a part of it. Uh, but also um, having a pastor's heart, having compassion towards um, the sheep and towards the lost and towards those that have been wounded. And one of the things that just grieves my spirit is when people are, have been broken and wounded in the church, quote unquote, turned out in the church. And there's people in high places in the church that have turned these individuals out, but yet they go on and continue to act like normal. Some people are even saying now how they get out of saying that they're in this sin. You have men in leadership in the church that say, as long as they play the role of a man, they're not really a homosexual and they're not involved in homosexual sin. Listen, mister, you are in sin and you are wrong and you are a hypocrite. But this is the argument that they make and it's really not a brand new argument. The scripture says nothing new is up under the sun. That came from the Greco-Roman culture where they felt as long as you were playing the role of a man, you are not actually a homosexual. And it's the same even in many Middle Eastern uh, uh, cultures and locales. But uh, again, all unrighteousness is sin. In Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, you know, you may get away with man, but you're not going to get away with God. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God sees it all. And what we really need to focus on so many times in the church, we focus on what's happening in everybody else's life. But when we stand before God, it's going to be nobody but God and us. We're not going to be able to blame everybody else and say, well, this one was doing this and that one was doing that. You know, God's going to say, why were you doing what you were doing? You know, why were you committing the sins that you were committing? And you will have to give an account. Thou fool, this night that will have to give an account for your soul. What shall you give in exchange for your soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And I think about two songs when I think about this subject. I think about two songs. One song says, I got to clean up what I messed up and I'm going to start my life all over again. That's really what should come from this lesson tonight. Everyone should look at themselves and say, I've got to clean up. Have mercy on me, oh God. It may not be that particular sin, but maybe again, it's gluttony. Maybe you talk too much, you know. Uh, again, I'm going to list some of the sins. There's, there's over 600 sins listed in the Bible and a lot of things that we never talk about. But all unrighteousness is sin. Another song says this, sweep around your own front door. Take six months to uh, mind your own business and six months to leave other people's business alone. We try to be the sin detector. But I wonder, I wonder, I want, put, Hankerson, put your hand down because you're not preaching. Don't put your hand behind your ear. But I wonder, saints of God, I wonder, I wonder if in the church there was a sin detector. Like when I go to the airport and go through TSA, and have to go through that metal detector. And the metal detector, it just detects everything uh, in regard to what you have on. Um, I wonder what would happen if in the church you had a sin detector. And that sin detector would go off anytime there's a sin. 
in somebody's life. I wonder who could get in the door. I wonder who could get through the door because the sin detector is going to detect everything. You can hide it. I went through uh, one time and I got mad at TSA. Oh, I was mad as a junkyard dog. I was upset because I, I just wasn't in the mood. You know, sometimes you get middle age and your, your bones are hurting and you're traveling. You're up early in the morning, go to sleep late at night and all. I doesn't feel like being bothered. And I got to TSA where, you know, you don't have to take off your shoes and all of that. And so anyways, they took my bag out and said, whose bag is this? I said, it's my bag. What's it to you? You know, I'm upset. I got an attitude and everything. Totally upset. And they go through the bag. And I'm sitting there with arms folded with an attitude like, you know, you're not going to find anything in my bag. And what did they do? Pull out a soda that I had in there that I forgot was in there. I didn't realize, to realize that the soda was in there. I, I, didn't, yeah, I forgot all about it. And they pull out this big bottle and said, this can't go. And so imagine, what, what, what do you have in your bag? Put that in the comment section. What do you have in your bag? We all need to check our bags and make sure our bags are packed and make sure we're ready to see Jesus when he comes. That is my focus. Now, again, I'm going to preach this gospel. I'm going to tell you right from wrong. I'm going to tell you that it's holiness or hell. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to make no excuse for you or me, but just like I tell Life Center, on that great day when we stand before God, don't come trying to tap on my shoulder. Pastor, pastor, help me get it. It's every man for himself on that day. And so now is the time to get it ready. So again, I see some of you putting in that in the comment, and that's great. What is in your bag? What's in your bag that you forgot about? What's in your bag that you didn't think about? Now, listen, presiding Bishop Blake, I was with him on last week, and one thing about Bishop is this. Uh, Bishop, when you show him a picture on your phone, Bishop purposely is not just going to look at the picture that you show him. Bishop is going to take your phone and he's going to start scrolling through all your pictures. What's on your phone? Put that in the comment section. What, what's in your phone? What's in your phone? You know, what have you been looking at? What have you been indulging in? And so we must say like the scriptures, search me, oh God, try me and know my heart. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, church people can be some of the, now the saints, when you talk about a saint, a saint is holy, a saint is righteous, a saint is loving, a saint is, is, is kind, but church people can be some of the evilest. Uh, one of you the other day uh, put on the Facebook, you said um, uh, how the saints used to talk so bad about the devil. I thought I was the only one that did that. I can't stand that booger. I mean, I'll call him an old rat face, snaggle tooth, red eye, low down, dirty, ugly, nasty devil and wretch from the pit of hell. I mean, you want to see somebody talk about the devil, I can do it. Uh, but, but he's nasty and he's low down. And sometimes church people can be just as nasty and low down. Realize this, believers and unbelievers that are watching, everybody in the church house, everybody in the worship service is not necessarily saved. There's an invisible church and there's a visible church. The visible church is everybody that shows up, everybody that attends, everybody that has positions, everybody that participates. But the invisible church, that's the true believers. And the scripture says, the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what the word of God says. Now, this lesson um, is, is, is being presented to you to deal with this subject matter. Should all homosexuals be put out to church? But some of it really hits close to home when we deal with this subject. In 2014, about five, six years ago, when Missouri Midwest, the jurisdiction that I'm privileged and honored to be the jurisdictional bishop of, was being vetted, we had a couple people, a couple pastors actually, that were on our roll, pastors in our group, our proposed jurisdiction, you could call it that, that had been delivered from a previous lifestyle of homosexuality. I knew their um, testimony. They had talked to me, Hankerson, I came out of this. Um, Hankerson, I've been in this. I just want to give you full disclosure so you're not caught off guard, you're not shocked. And of course, as a pastor, um, you're going to hear all kinds of things. And, and um, you're going to hear all kinds of testimonies. And you pray for those individuals. You believe God for those individuals. But these individuals that came to me said, hey, I've been delivered from this lifestyle. I said, hey, you know, as long as you're not uh, doing it now, I said, one thing I'm going to tell you is this. I'm not going to tell you what's wrong. I'm going to tell you what the word says. 
uh, one one pastor sat down with me one time and told me, he said, man, you, we were sitting around the table and you just looking at us talking about it's righteousness or hell, it's holiness or hell, no adultery, nothing like that. And you looking right at me. You know, I said, well, if the shoe fits, wear it, but I'm just going to put the word out there. If I got to live right, you got to live right. If I got to live holy, you got to live holy. If I've got to be clean, you've got to be clean. Those of you that are texting me, can you wait at least tell them over with? Y'all know that I'm on the the show, you kind of irritate me doing that, and it's definitely when you know that I'm on the um, webcast. But um, out of jealousy, because a new jurisdiction had not been started in um, St. Louis since 1963, there were those that scandalized the entire group and said, Hankerson has nothing but homosexuals, starter churches, and wildfire. That's what was stated. Well, Hankerson, what you need to do, you need to put their names out there and give their name. Listen, Giving names doesn't do anything. You know why? Because when it comes to persecution, when it comes to being talked about, when it comes to being ridiculed, as a minister, you can't take it personal. If it was Sambo starting, you know, a Timbuktu jurisdiction, it would be the exact same scenario. So quit taking everything personal because when you take it personal, you feel like, okay, this is against me, so i got to lash out and I've got to attack back. And that's how come there's so much strife. And, and things going on in the body of Christ now. So realize this, if you weren't you, if you had a different name, if it was a different scenario, if it was a different city or whatever, uh, whoever it is that's anointed, you are going to be talked about. You are going to be ridiculed. Jesus was talked about. And if you're the type of person that nobody has anything bad to say about you, uh, you better check your walk because they persecuted Jesus. It says he came to his own and his own received him not. You know, thank God for all of the followers and people that listen week after week. Like I said, it was around 10,000 or so that watched on last week, but you always have a few. I got a couple that, you know, as a matter of fact, one person, see Periscope, that's a whole different field altogether. I get cussed out all the time over there, but thank God I got some, um, I got some uh, 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 prayer warriors that are keeping that covered in the blood. But we were talked about as a group that said the whole group is full of this and said it's the biggest mess that there's ever been. And one person in particular said this, said it's the biggest mess the, the church has ever seen. And that same individual that had that to say, it was found out months later after that, that he had a concubine on the side. You know, did we attack him? No. Did we pray for him? Yes. Do I still love him? Yes. That's what you have to do. And again, you can go to my blog every time I turn around blogspot.com and see the lesson that I dealt with on forgiveness. You know, um, forgiveness is not always for the other person. <laughs> forgiveness, 90% of the time, is for you to make sure that you're right, to make sure that your relationship with God is intact. It doesn't mean that what they did is okay, but it means that I'm not going to get stopped by this. I got too much going on to be stopped by this, and I need to move on. Um, just all kinds of awful things that were said about this um, uh, group. And when, talk, when talking with those that vetted us as a jurisdiction, they say, you know, we don't see this evidence, all of what these people are talking about, uh, no more than any other group. Because if, if we had a sin detector, we could go through every church, we could go through every jurisdiction, we could go through every diocese, whatever you call it in your denomination, if you call it a fellowship or whatever. And again, what if there was a sin detector at the front door of the church? I wonder who it is that would be able to get in because a metal detector is going to pick up anything, like it picked up that bottle. And there's been times I've gone through the metal detector at the airport and it's just some lint in my pocket. It, it will pick up. And then um, they got this wand for some reason for the longest. It stopped now. But for some reason, saints, for the longest, every time I'd walk through, they'd go through and they'd have to get this wand and they'd get down on my belly, you know. And I said, it ain't nothing but fat down there. So why you keep doing this every time? I got, you know, I was just in one of those moves. I didn't feel like being bothered. But the detector is going to pick up everything. So what we have to do is make sure that we are right and we're ready when Jesus comes. But there was one meeting that got so intense that um, one of my uh, friends got up and shut the meeting down. And I forget the parliament proce parliamentary procedure that you call, uh, but there was a parliamentary procedure that you do that you can literally table a discussion and shut everything down. And uh, he stopped the discussion. I said, man, um, I had some things that I had to say in that meeting, and I wonder why did you uh, stop me? He said, well, the thing about it is, is I saw that look on your face. I said, look on my face. I really try to hide, you know, what I'm feeling and, and really hide my um, 
expressions. I said, but you really did have the Holy Ghost that day because you detected what I was about to say because literally what I was about to say was this. Okay, brethren. Okay, brethren. If we're going to deal with somebody that has uh, repented of a sin, they walked away from it, and because they walked away from it, we have this particular stigma about them and want to look at them a certain kind of way because of what they came out of. Let's do this. Let's be fair. Let's deal with the rapists that are in this room right now. Let's deal with the alcoholics that are in this room right now. Let's deal with those that are supposed to be men of the cloth that are adulterers in this room right now. But the thing about it is with you, it just hasn't caught up with you yet. You just haven't been caught. Uh, you just haven't been openly shamed. So why take somebody that has been openly shamed, repented, and left what they were in and uh, sit up there and condemn them and not deal with those that are in current sin? So again, I call fouls on everybody. All unrighteousness is sin. Now, we have respect to persons, and we got to stop that in the body of Christ. But let's start doing this. Let's deal with every sin that's in the Bible. I don't have time to go all completely through it, but when you get a chance, Google it, look it up, go to the library, look in the Strong's Concordance, um, you know, whatever it is that you do when you study the word and study every single sin in the Bible. I have found literally over 600 sins in the Bible, and many of these we don't mention at all. Accusing is in the Bible. Um, adultery is in the Bible. That's a sin. Being afraid of people is a sin. Being afraid to confess Jesus before people is a sin. Unjustified anger is a sin. To be angry with your brother is a sin. Arguing, according to Proverbs 17, 14, that's a sin. Arguing, Hank, saying, what you mean? See there, that's, you got that spirit right now. You ready to argue now? Arguing, I'll give it to you. Proverbs 17, 14, Proverbs 18 and 6, Titus 3 and 9, 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 and 12. I tell you, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to come before you without scripture. We're going to come before you with the word of God. Arrogance is a sin. Being ashamed of Jesus is a sin. To assault somebody is a sin. Astrology is a sin. Backbiting is a sin. Um, bitterness is a sin. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is a sin. Not blessing them that curse you is a sin because Jesus said, bless those that curse you. Boasting is evil. Uh, what else do we have? Um, being against a child of God is a sin. Deceiving a child of God is a sin. Um, hindering or beating God's servant. Hopefully nobody does that. Luke 2, 45, that's a sin. Watch this. Not clothing God's children that have need, according to Matthew 25, 43, that's a sin. Not feeding God's hungry children that are hungry. Matthew 25, 42, that's a sin. How can we don't talk about that? Not feeding the hungry. Not visiting those that are in prison. Not taking in a homeless child of God. That is a sin. Matthew 25, verse 43, and verse 45, and also 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. Not visiting God's children that are sick is a sin. Matthew 25, 43. Um, refusing to hear God's servants, 1 John 4 and 6, that's a sin. And it goes on and on and on and on. There are literally being a busybody, Proverbs 20, verse 3, 1 Timothy 5, verse 13. Putting the cares of this world before God, Mark 4, 19, that's a sin. When you're more into your career, when you're more into what you have to do, when you're more into the baseball game, you got to miss church because you head into the baseball game. I understand every now and then, but every week something is wrong with that. Being carnal or worldly is a sin. Threatening somebody, according to Acts 9, verse 1, verse 4 and 5. According to John chapter 9, verse 22, verse 28, verse 34, and verse 54. See what I'm saying? All unrighteous, not having love in your heart. 1 Corinthians 13 and 2, that is a sin. Not going to church. Hebrews 10, 25, that is a sin. There are over 600 sins that are mentioned in the Bible. However, this does not negate the fact what the Bible has to say about homosexuality as well as lesbianism. Now, somebody sent me a message, said, well, Hankerson, lesbianism is homosexuality. I understand that. But it seems like in the church, we focus so much on males being involved in the homosexual lifestyle, and you hear very little that's being said about the ladies that are involved in that lifestyle as well. It's easy to be able to tell a man when they show up in their dress very flamboyant and coming in with you know, all the stuff that they wear. I'm, I've never been a fashion person, so I couldn't tell you. I just get up and throw something on. Um, but I try to be clean, and I try to make sure that my stuff is ironed and all of that. But as far as um, colors and putting things together, color coordinating and all of that, 
um, you can just forget it. That, that's, you know, I just stay basic. Black, brown, blue, and gray. That's about it. Now, when you see me in a something more so than that, you just have to look. But that's basically it, just dark um, colors. But it's easy to focus when we see individuals coming around like that. I do understand that. But realize this, lesbianism is just as much of a sin, and a lot of times it's more hidden. It is just as prevalent, but a lot of times it's more hidden. So let's not just focus on one area. Let's focus on the whole thing. You're going to shoot the gun, you got to shoot it. You're going to shoot the gun, you got to shoot the whole thing. Leviticus 18.22 is still right. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. So I said all of the things I said before to say this, just because you got the hypocrisy, just because you got folks doing all kinds of things, just because you have people with a double standard, it does not negate what the word of God has to say. And that's not a hate message. This is simply the word of God. Uh, because again, if preaching against sin is hate, I told you there's well over 600 sins mentioned in the Bible. And really that would be hatred towards everybody. Romans 1, 26 through 27, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did not change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working what is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. I hear what you're saying, Hankerson, it's a sin, but let's deal with some things. If a preacher always focuses on this one sin, Hankerson, does that preacher have a hidden issue actually with homosexuality? Because there are some preachers that every time they get up, you know, my motto was every time I turn around, God is blessing me. And there's some preachers every time they get up, that's all they're talking about. So the question is this, if you have a preacher, if you have a minister, if you have a pastor that all the time, the only thing that they talk about, and if they deal with any other subject, it comes back to dealing with homosexuality. Is that person an undercover homosexual themselves? Well, first of all, the only person I sleep with is Lady Hankerson, so I can't tell you what half of these folks are doing. I don't sleep with nobody else except her, and that's all I need, all right? But the only way we can determine that would be to go into everybody's heart and mind and see what's happening. However, that's impossible because God only gives us a word of wisdom or word of knowledge. Now, I have seen many instances where that is the case, where a person constantly harps on something, and the reason why is because they have an issue with it themselves. I've even had an individual that um, I knew it came out of that lifestyle, and we were sitting in the worship service one time, and the preacher got up and was preaching against homosexuality, and that was the first one up screaming, yeah! You're right, you're right, you're right. It's just, I'm like, wait just a minute, wait just a minute. Didn't you just, uh, you know, confide in me that you came out of that and now you're trying to shoot at everybody else? So sometimes, what do they say? The dog that hollers the loudest, that's the one that got hit. That's not in the scriptures, but, you know, in many circumstances, that may be the case. I've seen that in some instances. However, that's only my observation, and I can't speak to every single case of every single preacher in the nation. And that's why we as preachers, we have to be so careful. We just act not only that we are, we don't always act like we are the man of God. Sometimes we act like we're the God of man, and we are not. He's the only one that knows everything and all of what's going on in everybody else's life. Now, I can assume, but you don't always want to assume. That's the problem that happens in church is because we're always assuming, we're always uh, and we assume the worst for other people. First Corinthians 13 says that love is not looking for the bad in everybody. It's looking for the good in everybody. Another question is this. Why does it seem like Pentecostalism seem to have um, homosexuality and lesbianism more than any other faith? You know, people will say, well, that's where they all are. Every, the word that people use is um, uh, flaming, flaming. You know, this church is just flaming. That denomination is just flaming. First of all, before you um, sit up here and, and condemn an entire denomination. Let's use my denomination, for example, the Church of God in Christ, 6.5 million members. Now, some of you can laugh at that and say, oh, Church of God in Christ doesn't have 6.5 million. Well, if you go all around the world where the Church of God in Christ is found, I have one of the saints from Brazil that's on the line right now. When you go to Brazil, most of those people have never been to the United States of America, but when they have convocation, let me tell you, they have convocation. I just preached there a few months ago, place just standing room only, folks all over the place. So worldwide, you're looking at around 6.5 million members in the Church of God in Christ. To take two or three people 
and to condemn an entire denomination. Oh, that whole denomination is just flaming. What you're literally saying is that you're God and you know every single person in the church of God in Christ and you have a right to say, well, everybody in the church is like this. You don't. You're not God, so you don't have the right to say that. Say it like it is. That there's a few people that you ran into and this is what you have found with these few individuals, but you can't and you don't have a right to take a whole denomination and say that. Again, that's a blanket statement if you say homosexuality is found in Pentecostalism uh, more than any other faith. You would have to talk to every individual in every faith community and see what their sexual orientation is. That's almost impossible to determine. However, perhaps the reason it may seem so high in the Pentecostal faith is because Pentecostals are uh, evangelistic and being evangelistic. Yeah, definitely praying. Uh, yeah. Send me an inbox message, uh, uh, Brother Corbin, send me an inbox message. Um, that's what makes it seem more visible because we're on radio, we're on television, we're on the internet. And so any issues that Pentecostalism may have, it's going to seem bigger than any other, uh, religious organization, bigger than any other religious faith. But again, you cannot take one entire denomination and just say that it's like there's a one particular faith. There are 385 million Pentecostal slash charismatic slash uh, tongue talking people in the world. 385 million. That's as many people as in the United States of America. So you can't take an entire group and say it's like that. Another question people ask is, is being effeminate the same as being a homosexual? Not necessarily. At least in the black church, you mostly see women and children. As a result, many people grow up emulating the spirituality of the women of God, like the church mothers. And that's why you so oftentimes hear people saying, oh, those old mothers would do this and those old mothers would do that. Uh, you never hear them really talk about the old fathers in the church, but there were fathers. But many people emulate the spirituality of the ladies because many times in church, that's mostly what you see. Also, many children in the black community have been raised without fathers. In many cases, it's a single mother or grandmother who has to take on both roles of the parent. That must be taken into consideration. However, a man is not to act like a woman and vice versa. A woman is not to act like a man. The Bible teaches against that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. And we can argue all day about, you know, women wearing pants and men wearing dresses and men wearing, you know, well, that's cultural and all of that. But we know pretty much when a man is acting like a woman and a woman is acting like a man, that's straining that and that and swallowing a camel. That's really silly to get off into something like that. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So instead of standing back and criticizing and talking really what needs to happen in the church, we need more men's ministry. I'm not talking about a men's day. I'm not talking about a men's program. I'm talking about uh, mentoring programs and things like that really more so need to take place in the church besides just having services and dealing with men things uh, so that young boys can grow up in the church looking up to real men uh, that do real men things. Well, Anderson, what is men things? Listen, again, that's straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, okay? So we know that there is a difference between male and female. God made that difference in Genesis chapter 1. Well, Hankerson, the scripture is saying, God, there is no male or female. That's dealing with salvation in the book of Galatians because that's what Paul is dealing with. Deal with every scripture in context. Now, to answer the question, should all homosexuals be put out of the church? Shame on you as well. Whoever's saying that to me, shame on you. Uh, right back at you. Anyone should be welcome to attend a church. Anyone should be welcome to attend a church. And shame on you because you just sit up and listen to two, three sentences and you don't uh, listen to the whole lesson. So shame on you. You can go on about your business. Anyone should be welcome to attend a church, but no one should be put out from a worship service unless they are causing a disturbance. Even then you want to see why they're causing the disturbance. So when it comes to a worship service, again, you know, if you have some kind of radar and you're trying to you know, all right, let me determine who's in this and who's in that. Uh, you're probably not going to have anybody at your uh, worship service at all because the scripture says everyone can praise the Lord. Psalm 150 and verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You see, saints, I have intercessors praying for me. I got folks around the nation covering me in the blood. So I'm, I'm armed and ready. So you want to come with it tonight? Let, let's, let's go. You know, let's go. And so I thank God for those that have me um, 
covered in prayer. And that's why I don't allow myself to get distracted uh, because there's people that are covering these lessons, covering the airwaves and everything in prayer. And I just want to say I appreciate those prayer warriors because it's through your prayers that I'm able to share and spread the gospel across the country and around the world. So thank you so much. And that's how we're able to uh, stay focused. So if you want to get on here and cuss me out, call me a hate monger and all those kind of things, you know, here's what you can do. You can just simply get off. You don't have to watch because it's not like I'm sitting here watching your program. You're watching me. Um, watch this. Everyone can praise the Lord. Psalm 150 and 6. However, only those that know. Did he just? Yes, I did. Uh, and not ashamed of it. However, only those that know Christ. I see all those hearts going up. Um, yeah, don't, just just don't do it. Just don't do it. However, only those that know Christ can truly worship. Everybody that has breath, everything that has breath. I mean, the dogs, the, 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 the birds, everything that have breath can praise the Lord. Everyone is welcome to praise the Lord. However, only those that know Christ can truly worship because John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the more you worship, when you truly worship, I'm not talking about the entertainment we see in church. That's a whole nother lesson I'm going to teach on one time because half of what we call preaching and half of what we call worship is really entertainment. Um, you know, some people can't even pray. You know, come on, y'all, get with me. Get You just probably focus on praying. You just pray and talk to the Lord and, you know, we'll get to where we need to get. But quit focusing and worrying on us. So a lot of stuff we do is really entertainment. But when you truly, 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 truly worship God, when you truly love God and get close to him, he will condition your heart and deal with you. And I'm going to tell you this. When I go into the presence of God, you know, God didn't always come in, you know, and telling me, here's what's going on with everybody else. The focus is on he and I, and he deals with me in my time with him. And that really should be what happens in our prayer time, not focusing on, you know, we go trying to be deep and just, you know, looking at everybody in the church service. You know, God sees you. Well, God sees you too. God sees what's going on with you, with your self-righteous spirit. So here's what we have to understand. Everybody can praise the Lord. Everybody should be welcome to attend a worship experience, a worship service. However, attending church and leading church are two totally different things. It was not uncommon for unbelievers to come among the saints in worship services in the New Testament church, 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 24. However, there were very strict guidelines for serving in leadership in the church. According to 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 24, Paul had to even talk to the church at Corinth how to conduct themselves in a worship service because you had so many abuses that were taking place where folk were just talking in tongues for 30 minutes. That's a whole lesson in itself right there. And Paul had to regulate. He said, hold on, hold on. If you have unbelievers coming, they're not going to know what you're doing. They're going to think you're crazy if everybody's getting up there speaking in another language. He says, speak and then interpret. And at the most, let there be two or three in a worship service. And that's it. So if you talk in tongues and interpret, you talk in tongues, you interpret, you talk in tongues, you interpret. He says, after that, I don't care if the fourth person feels like they're on fire. They got to be quiet. That's it. He says, but everybody can prophesy. See, those are things that we don't deal with also, and we're going to deal with that in the, in the future. So in the early church, they were sensitive to the fact that unbelievers would come among them. And so unbelievers were welcome to come and welcome to be in their midst. But Paul says, Everybody really should prophesy because there should be some conviction in a worship service where the secrets of a person's heart are revealed. I, I, I hear you, uh, Sierra Sumter, just pray for me. Um, uh, but, but nevertheless, you know, that's what should happen. There should be a change. There should be a difference. See, I don't go to church just looking. A lot of people are really looking for um, what, did, what did George Bush call it? Shock and awe. They're looking for the clouds and all this. And that's wonderful. You know, I want to see the sick healed and the clouds come in. Cloud came in when I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. But really, when I come to the house of God, something should be done and said and goes forth that I learn more, I grow more, I'm stronger, um, uh, I'm exhorted that I can be able to stand in these last and evil days you know, it's a healing when I come into the presence of God and I'm around the saints. I'm not always in the best of moods, not always feeling the best. But as you come in the midst of the saints and the saints are glorifying God, you should feel edified. That's what I feel when I come to Life Center, you know, the church that I pastor. I, I, and, and the saints know, they say he just enjoys being 
around the saints. I do, because there's a difference that takes place, and that's really what should happen. What good is the cloud? What good is it to see all of the glory? What good is it to see all these things and then leave out the exact same way? You know, there's one big um, preacher that was just recently involved in the scandal, really wasn't recently involved in the scandal, but recently it came uh, known to people that he was involved in all kinds of things. I'm talking about, you know, child sexual abuse and rape and all these kind of things. But yet when you came to his services, I mean, there were words of knowledge and wisdom and prophecy and miracles and healings and all of that stuff taking place. But what good is all of that if there's no change when I come to the house of God? There's no change when I come to the presence of God. The early church was very forgiving, but they were very strict. Let me review some things that I've shared with you before. Fellow Christians are to be restored, according to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one and a spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. But those who refused to do right were to be shunned, according to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. I don't care what you say, I'm not going to do right. I don't care what you say, I'm not going to live right. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 and 11, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slander, a drunkard, a swindler, don't even eat with such people. That brings us to another question that was asked earlier. Is there an underground homosexual church in various denominations that actually runs denominations? Um, I'll say it like this. There's an underground in every church of some of everything, because generally, even if you have a local church, your drunkards are going to get together. Your gossips are going to get together. Your whoremongers are going to get together. Your homosexuals are going to get together. Uh, your, 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 your prayer warriors are going to get together because people associate with what they feel comfortable or common with. So yes, you find that in many different denominations. And really one of the things that causes homosexuality to stand out is the fact that in many cases there is an agenda. There is an agenda in the educational field. There's an agenda in the entertainment field. There's an agenda in the religious field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yes, there are denominations where folks are like, oh, you're in that lifestyle? Yeah, I'm in that lifestyle. So they get together and they determine they're going to support each other and anybody else that doesn't support what they're doing, you know, they're going to. And, and it happens in every sin in the church. You don't tell on me. I'm not going to tell on you, but I thank God there are people that are watching today that are saying, if, if it costs my life, I'm going to make it to that city and I'm not going to be a part of that foolishness. And so you can say all what you want to say. I'm going to stand for what is right. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 11, those that just refuse to do what's right, he says, shun them. This is in the word of God. Some were even turned over to Satan. 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, hand that man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Take note that the man did later on repent, and that was the man that was having sexual relations with his uh, stepmother in 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians, he repented. Paul said, go ahead and turn him loose and, and forgive him now because he has uh, repented. In some cases in the Bible, there are places where people were to be excommunicated altogether. So for those of you that say, oh, no, you never to excommunicate nobody. You never to put no one out. This is the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, uh, 15 through 17. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. If they will not listen, take two or one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even the church should treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So there is excommunication, but you just better make sure that your business is together before you talk about excommunicating somebody else. Evidently, prayers were even ceased for certain individuals. In 1 John 5, 16 through 17, it says, If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. The church considered some people in New Testament times to be completely rejected. Let me say this, Christianity now does not resemble the Christianity of the New Testament church. You have to understand we've gone through Constantine and the Roman Empire and all these different things all together. <laughs> You're like, yeah, treat him as a tax collector. That's what it said. 
Um, but it's totally different. It's totally different than what it was during the time of Christ. Christianity was more considered a small sect within Judaism. Judaism is strict within itself. And so this sect was even stricter than the parent body, which was Judaism. And so with the ministry of Paul, uh, with Gentiles coming into the church, with becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, uh, it's, it's a totally different setting. Back then, you know, they went into all the world, but they were very strict. Even Jesus, he said to his disciples going to all the world, but he told them, he said, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but you go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. And so scripture says uh, during that particular time, they were so strict that some people would be completely rejected, 2 Timothy 3 and 8. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men depraved mind, of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, they are rejected. The early church was very strict on its leaders. Leaders were to be blameless, 1 Timothy 3 and 2. Leaders were to be pure, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Sinning, unrepentant leaders were to be openly rebuked. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20. It says, first of all, don't entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought to you by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that others may take warning. Some leaders were to be totally rejected and shunned. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. According to the word, God does not look at leadership in the kingdom as a right. It is a privilege. I'm not going to get it right now because I turn all the cameras over. Um, but if I got my driver's license, when I was um, taking driver's ed way back in ancient times when I was 15 years old, I think it was 15 or so. Anyways, it, it was in high school. I was taking uh, driver's ed. Um, they taught us very emphatically during that time that driving is a privilege and not a right. And it's a privilege that you have, but it can also be revoked. We have made it like ministry is a right. Ministry is not a right. You don't have a right to be in ministry. It is a privilege to be in ministry. And it is a privilege that is granted by God. And it is also a privilege that can be taken by God. What do I mean? In some cases, you, you, you find one thing. In some cases, you find another. But in the scriptures I'm going to give you, God was very strict when it came to his leaders. Moses was not allowed to continue to be a leader after disrespecting God. God initially told him, take the people out of Egypt into the promised land. People messed up, went around 40 years, all of that. In the book of Numbers, you, you, you read about that story. And um, 40 years there in the wilderness when it's supposed to take only a few days journey probably a little more than a few days, because that's going actually through a wilderness. That's going through a desert. But basically, it wasn't supposed to take 40 years. But Moses messed up so bad, God said, listen, my initial plan was for you to carry the people in. I'm scratching that. S scratch that totally up. And uh, scratch it up and say, you're not going to do it. Numbers 20 and 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to, enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this uh, community in the land that I gave them. Reminds me of a story that was told about Bishop Mason uh, back in the old days in the Church of God in Christ. You really didn't have the executive branch, which is the presiding bishop and the general board, and the legislative branch, which is the general assembly, and the judicial branch, which is the judiciary board, and the pastors and elders council. What you had, Bishop Mason was serving as an apostle, and being an apostle, he was the legislative, executive, and judicial and so one day he had um, um, appointed a person to be a, a state bishop and given the papers, signed the papers and everything and sent them on about his way. And one of the elders came to him shaking and said, said, Dad, that's just not right. That's not right. Bishop Mason said, what are you talking about? He said, that's the guy up there in that state that caused you so much trouble. He said, is that that boy that, that did? He said, yeah, that's the one that caused you so much trouble. He said, send him back in here. Man, was going outside whistling, just happy. He's just been appointed as a bishop. Uh, they came back in Bishop Mason's office. He said, come here. Bishop Mason took them papers that he had and <laughs> ripped them up and said, nope, that's the end of that. You know, just like I appointed you, I can disappoint you. And it's the same with God. God appoints and God can also disappoint. And, and we make it almost like there's no discipline with this. There is discipline 
and there is a certain way that we are to conduct ourselves as God's minister. Well, I'm being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit doesn't mean a lot of crazy things and foolishness and, and, and off-brand spirit. It doesn't mean that. Saul was rejected as a leader for uh, rebelling against God, 1 Samuel 15, 28. David was allowed to continue to lead after he repented of his sin. And 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12 through 13, but the consequence was this. You may have been forgiven, but your whole house was cursed. So you wonder, what would you have rather been? You know, because people compare Saul and David. Well, Saul repented and, um, you know, or, or felt sorry at least. Well, he didn't, I won't say he repented, but he cried out. And, um, and, and Samuel went away from him and God said, don't even worry about him anymore. I've rejected him. Uh, David cried out. David was forgiven. And somebody may say, well, it just doesn't seem fair. Um, Saul um, sinned and rejected God. What people don't realize is that he didn't stop being king uh, once he ended up being disciplined by God. He remained as the king. But what happened, that kingship was taken away from that tribe of Benjamin. Nevertheless, David, he repented and God forgave him. But do you want what David got? Some people think that Saul got the worst end of the stick. But I don't know about it. When you look at, at, at David in 2 Samuel 12, 10 through 14, his household was cursed. God said, you know, the sword is never going to depart from your house. This little child that you had uh, with this woman Bathsheba, that child's going to die. All your wives are going to be raped in front of everybody. Um, and what ended up happening is, is his son rapes his daughter, his son turns against him. I mean, it was a lot of crazy stuff. So like I say, you may, you, you, you may think you got away, but you can't get away with God. Peter was allowed to continue to serve after repenting, Luke twenty two thirty two. The whole point I'm making is this. Anybody can come to church and worship, but when it comes to being leader, a leader, it is a strict, strict guideline that God has for those in leadership. Judas was rejected from leadership even after acknowledging his sin, Matthew 27 and 4 and Acts 1 and 20. He said, I've sinned. I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So he completely lost his place. So again, to answer the question, um, should all homosexuals be put out of the church? Anybody can come and worship. Anybody can come and magnify God. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Um, but when it comes to serving in the church, there should be some kind of uh, standard. All right, God bless my uh, Instagram audience. You'll be going off in just a minute. And don't forget that you can always come over and tune in to Facebook and Periscope. Now, listen, what I've done tonight, I have purposely focused on presenting the lesson because I knew that there would be those trying to uh, distract me and lead me in all kind of different directions and going on wild goose chases and all of that. And I didn't want to allow myself to uh, be distracted in that manner. So that's one of the reasons that normally I look up and say things and respond to you all. But um, I didn't do that on this um, uh, um <laughs> All right, now I'm looking up here. Melissa Green says your timeline is really quiet tonight. I, <laughs> yeah, but you all, well, you need, what you need to do, come on over to the. Uh, you're not. You're on the um, fan page. You're not on the um, uh, personal page. If you get on that personal page, they're pretty noisy over there. You all make some noise. Hit some noise so Sister Melissa Green can know you all are there. Hit them heart buttons if you receive something from this teaching tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow uh, for a few questions tonight and hear from you. Uh, again, this is a discussion. All right. And Tasia Curtis said, what if you discern that they're lying about their sexuality as a leader? Would you remove them then? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, in cases like that, again, you really have to make sure you've heard from God. And really, the scripture says, and I read that earlier, uh, for those that are asking one minute and 44 seconds remaining on Instagram, you, you can come over to Facebook and Periscope. The question was asked of me, what if you discern that a person basically is a homosexual, but they say no, that they're not, and uh, how do you handle that? Um, you really can't deal with a person based on what you feel you've discerned or what you think, because um, you can discern and actually be off, because one of the things is this, a lot of the people that seem like they're um, so much um, homosexuals and all that. And this is this comes from me counseling people for the last 25 years in ministry. I'm a young man, but um, this year makes 25 years of pastoral ministry. Next year will make 40 years of salvation um, and, and being baptized in the Holy Ghost and being in ministry, coming out of a pastor's home. 
So I've heard it all, at least I think I have. Every time I think I've heard it all, then something else comes up. Um, but in counseling with people, a lot of times the people that you think are a certain way are actually not. And a lot of the people that you least expect and seem like the most you know, masculine person are involved in that. So you cannot go on just what you, um, yeah, you cannot go on what you um, just discern. The scripture says, uh, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And I'm trying to find that text that I can read to you, not a text on the phone, um, but the text basically, let's look at 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20 says this, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. And those two or three witnesses must be willing uh, to testify basically on the behalf of that person being in that sin. A lot of times what it is, people want to throw a rock and hide their hand. They're doing certain things and so they want to attack somebody. And then when you try to take them to the scriptures, do it like the scripture says, no, 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 that's okay. That's okay. Uh, and that's why a lot of times things become prevalent uh, within the church. And so we have to do more than just discern. Uh, yeah, like, like what was stated here, your discernment can be off, you know. Um, I dreamed all kind of things last night. I dreamed all kind of things. I mean, I was seeing roses. I was seeing, I can't even tell you, I, I, I remember the dreams when I first got up, but it was a series of three different dreams that I saw on last night. I mean, vivid dreams. I saw some roses um, and it was something else. But you know what that was? Um, I took a few minutes to barbecue yesterday and I had some barbecue pork steaks <laughs> and made some potato salad and all of that. I just had a taste for barbecue. And sometimes, you know, people have been asking, what's the best barbecue in St. Louis? Um, I'm not going to dog our city, but, you know, if you really want some good barbecue, you got to make it yourself. So long story short, you know, that's, that was, it was those pork steaks is what that was. That wasn't, I was, the Lord was just showing me. No, that was, that was the pork steaks and the um, uh, Baby Ray's uh, barbecue sauce is what it is. So we have to make sure, you know, that we've surely heard from God and there's going to be confirmation in, 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 in all of that. Um, you can go to a person, but if you go to a person, I would go to them uh, humbly and prayerfully. The Bible says, you which your spiritual restore such a one. Um, in, in, in meekness. See, the thing about it is I'm a holiness preacher. I am a sanctified preacher. I live all that I know, but nobody can say, well, Hankerson was just rude to me because he felt I was in this and that. I treat everybody the same. And the thing is, I couldn't be a prophet, Brother Wallace, Brother Rico Wallace. I, 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 I couldn't be a, a, a prophet. And I've talked to people about that. Um, maybe I have that mantle on me, but it's something i person told me that I was talking to and getting advice about this. Oh God, you run everybody uh, out the kingdom of God completely because I don't see the good things. I don't see the good things. God shows me people dying. I mean, a lot of times I'll dream this definitely hearing from God because I, I, I have dreams periodically. And when I dream it, a lot of times it's a dream about somebody dying. And I was dreaming one time and the time that the exact time I was dreaming, the exact time early in the morning when I was dreaming, that person was having a stroke at that exact time and ended up dying not too long after that. So God just doesn't always show, I wish I could see the cars and the houses and the, you know, and all of those things, I, but, but he doesn't, he doesn't give me that. And so, um, again, if, if, if he's going to deal with you, there's going to be confirmation, but again, nobody can ever say, even though I'm, I can tell if you're a whoremonger, I can tell all these things right away. Everything we see, we're not necessarily to talk about. Everything we see, some things we're to really pray about. You know, we're not always openly get up and address everything we actually see, you know, uh, because some some things are just horrible what you see. And God wants you to pray for that individual. But many times we want to show people that, oh, I'm he no, no, no. I see. I see. I'm discerning something. I'm discerning something. Again, sometimes, you know, it's just that we want to be seen of people as being somebody mystical and somebody spiritual when really our hearts desire should be, first of all, to make it ourselves and then to exhort our brothers and sisters to make it as well. So there should be witnesses. You know, what does a witness do? A witness testifies on behalf of something. So a witness isn't quiet. A witness isn't silent. A witness should be able to come forth and say, 
I know that person is no good and alert, dirty and rotten and low down because I saw them at the club the other night. I saw them at the club and they were sitting at the bar and they ordered a, a um, um, what do you all call those things? You all know what those things are. A margarita. They ordered a margarita. And then after they got done with the margarita, they ordered a, um, uh, what's the other thing? That pina colada. They ordered a pina colada. And, uh, you know, so you should be willing to testify as a witness. Now, if you testify as a witness to that, my next question is going to be, what were you doing at the club? <laughs> Seeing them order the pina colada and the margarita. Why were you there? So that's that's what we have to realize. Good question. All right. And uh, somebody's saying some things we see are familiar spirits. That's true. All right. And Jason Douglas says the Holy Spirit will never lead you incorrectly. The question is, what is it that the Holy Why was it that the Holy Spirit told you that? Correct. That's good. That's an excellent point. Why did he tell you that? First of all, if God shows me something, it's, it's for me to pray for that individual. And we do, let's be honest, saints, we do more talking than praying. Lord, you let the Lord show. The, the Lord showed me that so-and-so-and-so is a stone-cold alcoholic. Now, here's what we're not going to do. Let's just, let's talk about church people. Let's talk about ourselves. There's nobody but us. Let's talk about ourselves. What we're going to do, if God shows us that Sambo is a stone-cold alcoholic, we're not going to get down on our knees and pray and cry out and break that and God deliver them. We're going to pick up the phone and call somebody. You know, the Lord showed me this about so-and-so. So now we got five or six people that we've talked to. And it's just like that old shampoo commercial. I told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. Now Sambo walks in church on Sunday. Hadn't had a drink, ain't even thinking about drinking. But somebody thought they saw something, thought they heard from God. And now the whole church is looking at Sambo you know, what's he doing getting up there talking and reading the scripture? He's a stone cold alcoholic. So the first thing we ought to do, like Brother Jason Douglas says, is go before God in prayer. And God, now you showed me this. Now, what do you want me to do with it? Am I to go to that person? Am I, you know, you showed this to me. What's, what's supposed to happen? You know, nine times out of 10 is really for us to pray for each other. I've been in prayer before and been so, quote unquote, caught up into the spirit that God has given me the names of individuals I don't even know. He says, I want you to pray for so-and-so and so in such and such a place. She's dealing with this right now. I don't even know the person. I don't even know the person, but God will give me their names. Now, does that mean I get up in church services and all of that? And, and I'm Prophet Hankerson and I'm calling out names. For, it's not for that. It's, it's in my private devotion that God shows that and says, I want you to intercede for these individuals. That's why he asked me to do it. So it's something that is very private. Yeah, stone cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm old school, so that's 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 some of the uh, language. I'll take two more questions at this time. It's so good uh, uh, being here with you all, and you have to quicken them. Yeah, thank you, Deacon Colts. I appreciate that so much. If there's not any other questions um, or comments, I thank you all for tuning in, and will you please help me by doing this? You've been great tonight. Will you please share this program all across the internet? Will you please follow, like, share, and subscribe on the channel that you're on? specifically YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Periscope, Twitter, LinkedIn, the blog. Do that uh, so that we can continue to share this glorious gospel with everybody around the world. No problem whatsoever, and I hope that answered your question. You have to understand, when you ask me a question, I'll give a long answer. You're like, Lord, I only asked this short question. He just talked for 20 minutes. It's almost like when somebody gives a message in tongues and they go off for 20 minutes. He ba ma 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 sha. He ma 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 sha. Sha ma 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 sha. Sha ma 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 ma. And then they say, the Lord says it's gonna be all right. Now I'm mad because you take up twenty minutes doing all that talking, and it was just that's all you got to say is the Lord says all right. You better go and find something else from him from that taking up all that time. Of course, I wouldn't allow that much time taking up in the service, anyways. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I'm like that. I'll give you a long answer, and it's a short question. So. Um, that's the thing. Listen, if you're in the Seattle area, I will be there this weekend after my morning service. I'm leaving my morning service once it's done. Flying to Seattle, preaching that night. Uh, we'll also be in Lafayette, Indiana next week. Indianapolis, Indiana next week. 
Our state women's convention is next week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Dr. T. Marie Brown is our supervisor of the Department of Women, and uh, you'll be able to see all of that on the Missouri Midwest Facebook page. And again, thank you all for praying for our jurisdiction. What's funny to pick up on that story, people talk so much about our jurisdiction once we got started, but everybody's trying to do what we've done. Uh, there's at least five or six jurisdictions that have got started based on the pattern of Missouri Midwest. As a matter of fact, in the Church of God in Christ with the Standards and Extensions Committee, with the um, template that they use in establishing new jurisdictions, that template comes from Missouri Midwest. So the stone which the builders has rejected, my God, has become the head of the corner. It's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Can, how can someone get in contact with me for counseling? Ooh, I'm so honored that you would um, ask for that. But actually, I have staff that assist me uh, with the counseling here at Life Center Church. I'm able to answer questions that you send, short questions that are straight to the point. I'm able to answer as the time sees fit. Uh, no, I'm not a hate monger. I'm preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, John 3, 16. And if that's what you think, you haven't sat here and listened to this whole lesson for an hour. So please go on about your business. You, go, you can go on move, next, moving right along. Moving right, I'm not even going to entertain that tonight. So getting on talk about hate mongering, uh, you're an ignorant person. You haven't sat there and listened. You want to just get on and take one minute and start uh, talking just based on a subject matter. Uh, and that's very ignorant. If you if you had any kind of sense what you would do, you'd sit there and listen to the whole thing and then respond back and we can correspond. I hear you, you hear me, we study the word of God, none of us knows it all and we go from there. But just going to get on saying that, I'm not tolerating it tonight. Keep on moving and those of you that's on Periscope, if they continue on just, um, you know, you know what to do. You all know how to do that, uh, whatever it is, reporting them or whatever it is like that. We're not going to deal with that tonight. Too many people want to hear the word of God instead of dealing with that um, foolishness. But um, for those that desire counseling, um, because the ministry is just so expansive, I, I really don't have the um, pleasure or the time of doing that, sitting down um, in major cases. And of course, with my church members, that's different. I have a local church, and with my church members, I try to make time uh, for my church members because that's that's my... Uh, that's my heart, the Life Center International um, Church of God in Christ. But again, if you have something that you uh, would like to share with me, send it to my inbox um, and do that. I'm a confidential person. I won't take your business and get up and um, preach about you and call your name out. You know so-and-so said this. I'm not going to do that. Um, and it won't be shared and spread with other people. Because one thing, saints of God, I don't know whether confidentiality is a virtue, but we really don't have that in the church. You know, you, you tell the saints, you tell the world. Um, there were there's a joke about some preachers that went out on the on a fishing trip one day, and two or three of them out there, and they said, um, "We're going to confess to each other, you know, what our um, hidden issues are." One person said that he had a problem in his flesh. One person said he had a problem drinking. Another person said he had a problem with drugs. And the other person on the um, ship and, and sent it to my inbox on Messenger on Facebook. And the other person said, well, i tell you what my confession is and the thing I'm dealing with. I'm a gossip, and I can't wait to get back home so I can tell what all y'all been doing. And really, when you look at it, <laughs> that's really the issue with a lot of the church. People don't have a life. Get you a life. Get you a hobby. Get something. You know, get, get something. Don't be on the phone all the time gossiping and just texting back and forth about what you think about somebody else and what you think they did and all that. Get a life. Get you a hobby. You know, learn about different subject matters. Don't don't be the type of person you're so heavenly minded, you know, earthly good. You can't talk about politics. You can't talk about current events. You can't talk about the economy. You can't talk about science. All you can do is talk about other people, you know, and that's really where maturity needs to take place in the body of Christ. You can't beat us talking in tongues. You can't beat us dancing. You can't beat us having church. But we really need to grow up in the body of Christ and mature as people, not just maturing in our faith, but mature as people so we know how to deal with people. That's the only way that we're going to evangelize because frankly speaking, a lot of people in the world think that Christians are weird. Oh yeah, because I'm a peculiar person. It doesn't, when the scripture says that, it's not talking about being crazy. It's not talking about not being able to have a decent conversation uh, with people about different subjects. 
Um, when the scripture talks about being peculiar, it means we're special, we're called, we're set apart, we're sanctified, we're holy, but we should be able to communicate with other people and know what we're talking about and be able to stand in the midst of different kinds of settings and, 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 and know what we're talking about. And so that's very, very, very important. So again, send me a message on my inbox. I don't think you can do it on Periscope, but come over to my Facebook page. I try to make it as public as I possibly can. And you can send that in there. And if you have a question now and realize this, let me tell you something. If I tell you I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. So don't just take that. He sent me a text and all he said was he's praying for me. Let me tell you, if I say I'm praying for you, I am praying for you. I'm not just saying that. Some people say it and they don't mean it. But if you get a response from me that says I'm going to pray or I'm praying, I actually mean that I will be praying not just really for you, but with you because you should be praying yourself as as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Don't forget, again, I'll be in Seattle. Uh, don't forget the um, Women's Convention for MMEJ. Don't forget uh, Holy Convocation is coming up. We're in the midst of our 40-day consecration. Um, we're excited about the convocation in St. Louis, a reunion of the saints. Looking forward to all of what God does. If you want to support this ministry, what you can do right now, you can share this lesson that you have seen tonight with as many people as possible, not because I think that I'm all of that, but because I know that God has given me this message for this mess age. Listen to it. Make the comments. I try to come back at times. I don't get to see all the comments all the time, but I really try. Yeah, Lafayette, Lafayette, Indiana. That is on, um, is that Wednesday night, um, uh, Prophet? Wednesday night, I'll be in Lafayette and Saturday in... Um, Oh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and so on and so forth. God is just opening up so many doors, and I appreciate everybody that has uh, opened the door to this ministry. I've been to most of the jurisdictions in the grand old church of God in Christ, and I preach also outside of the um, church of God in Christ. And so I thank God, though, for this grand old church. It's been a blessing to my life, a blessing to my family. I thank God for our presiding bishop. I minister for him on uh, last Wednesday night, and, and just honored to do that. President Bowles, I'll be with you Sunday night. I'll be in my own church Sunday morning, and then I will uh, head to Seattle and be there Thursday night. Thank you so much. I'll be there um, 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 in Seattle that night. We're also heading to, um, it's not Pasadena, but it's somewhere up, uh, Bishop Rome. Bishop Rome, be preaching for Bishop Terrence Rome the end of this month. It's not Pasadena. I don't think it's Pomona, but it's one of those areas, and we're looking forward to it. Yeah, we've been down in Florida. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much. Good being with you. Got to get ready. I need to um, drink some of my most holy water so I can get into Bible study and teach the Word of God tonight. Um, Pankerson, aren't you tired? Well, listen, I got full of the Holy Ghost, vitamin C, uh, Alka-Seltzer, all of the above. I didn't take any. Um five-hour energy drink, so you all, you all spread. I didn't take it today. I took it the other day, but I haven't been taking as much five-hour energy drink, and tonight I don't have a um, cola soda. I have a uh, diet white soda, so it's getting a little bit better. I'm trying to drink more water than uh, what I have uh, drunk in the past. It's just saints water doesn't have the taste. It doesn't have any taste to it, and so it's not always easy, so sometimes I just have to grit and just drink it, and I know you all say, well, the they got water with flavors. No, that's just not as um, good. All right. Bless you, Periscope. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Be blessed. Thank you so much on the fan page. Look forward to um, uh, seeing some of the comments as soon as I get a chance. Pray for me. This week I'm heading to Kansas City and Memphis. I got to head to Kansas City, then head straight to Memphis. So uh, pray for me on that, that the Lord will continue to give me strength. I may take drink some coffee on that one uh, as well. All right, but thank you all so much. Be bountifully blessed. Listen to the whole lesson and in its entirety and share it with everyone that you possibly can. Bless you until next time.